everyone. In advance, in case I forget, I want to thank Craig Burgess for uh, being the general behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Um, so this is the first of six sessions. We're doing one next month in November. Uh, we have to skip December, um, and then we're going to do four in the uh, winter and spring. Um, and and each, each one of them, we will take a chunk of David's life. Um, so the Bible, David is the most written about in the entire Bible, more than Moses. Yeah, he has two entire books, basically devoted, the first and second Samuel, to his rise um, and the story around him. Um, and then, of course, Chronicles also has him, uh, and even First Kings, we see him at the beginning as he's dying. So we learn an incredible amount about most people only know a little uh, about him, and um, so we're going to read through, mainly, the books and talk about what we learn about him. But I want to start by framing it this way. Um, each one of us has a story. Our story. What I mean by that is the way we understand our history, my history, how I view my growing up, how I view my parents and grandparents, how I view the home I grew up in, the way I remember my schooling, the way I remember what I did as a kid, the way I remember the process of growing older, becoming a spouse, of becoming parent, all of those things I have for my story. Nobody else has that story. <laughs> there is nobody that shares your story exactly. And there is no truth in that story. There's only your view of your story. And you know that if you have siblings. Because that, that always, if you were twins, it would even be more clear. But if you have siblings, you know that you each remember various incidences or people in different ways, right? That is that is the nature of the way we tell our story. Human beings, what distinguishes us from all other living creatures is our ability to tell stories. That is speech, using speech to shape stories, the big stories, the micro, the micro story is my story, my family story, my immediate world. That's the micro. <clears throat> then it moves out into a macro world. I, the way I think of Jewish history or American history or world history or human history, right? The way I think about the universe. Those are all stories that I understand, but there is no absolute truth in any of them. Just like money has no value, dollars have no value, except the value we give to it. Right? Any of you that have studied economics, you know there is nothing about a dollar or a gold or a silver or a diamond that has intrinsic value. We ascribe to it. That's our telling of stories. We need a way to do, to share things. So we come up with this system of barter, and then after barter, we come up with symbolic things that have value we can buy things with, because we need to create community. And we create community by stories. One of the reasons that I would argue America is in a crisis now is because when, we, when most of us grew up, there was a unified story that we were taught in school. Virtually all the schools Taught it. Now, maybe in the South, they might have differed on the civil rights and, and particularly on the Civil War. But you know, almost universally, we learned the stories of the founding of our nation and the development of our nation in one way. And it was pretty much taught the same way. Today, it isn't like that. Now we realize there are many ways to tell the story of America through indigenous peoples, through slavery through colonialization and 
the old story still works for some of us, right? And other stories. There's the whole issue of women, how women came into this and played a role and weren't recognized. So, so how we tell our story is, is essential to how we understand it. And as Jews, that's also true. And in Israel right now, they are also working on some kind of story because in the early days, first 20, 30 years, there was one story. And it was forced on everyone who went there. Wherever they came from, they came from Yemen, they came from Poland, didn't matter one story. They were taught a story, and they had to accept it because it was a culture. And any variation was, by the pressure of society, was kind of pushed to the side. But that isn't true any longer. And Israel is struggling with what is its story that can have a cohesion, just as we are, and just as many nations are in the world and peoples. So we're going to be looking at one of the most important stories of our people because of a number of reasons. Because we know and we often talk about the Torah story. We study that weekly. We learn that. We read it weekly. We learn that story if we go to religious school, right? But the stories after are more hit and miss. Obviously, there are moments like Purim when we learn one of the books, Esther. Some of us who go to Tisha B'Av might have lamentations if we read that. You know, we have the story of the Exodus at Passover, even though we tell it somewhat differently in our homes, depending on which home you grew up in, which home you run now, or have now, or whatever Seder you attend. Um, but much of that bulk of the story of our period of entering into the promised land and everything that takes place in the promised land, in expulsion, in diaspora, up until about the period of Malachi, the fourth, third, fourth century BC, <coughs> is all in there in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. And much of it, most of us don't know much about. We may know names here and there. We may know something of the nature of how it moved from one to the other, but we don't really know the details. And the most rich story is David's story. It's the most detail of any one individual. And David, of course, in rabbinic terminology, played an outsized role. Why? Why? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Well, the city of David is Jerusalem. He's the progenitor of the Mashiach, right? Of the Messiah, or the Messianic era, or the Messianic figure. Among other things, those are two very big rabbinic extensions of who he was. There's nothing about David in the story we're going to be reading that necessarily says that he was the progenitor to the Messiah, or was even the kind of character that you might want to base the Messiah on, right? You know, if you were if you were actually modeling a story, you might model the, the Christian story, right? The perfect man, God, who was perfect, right? I mean, that's the story that Christianity tells about Jesus. He didn't make mistakes. He didn't do anything sinful or wrong. He didn't sin. Right? So you might tell that story and say that's the, because the, and then they say there's a second coming of that figure. Makes sense. Perfect figure comes again to redeem humanity and the world. But that's not our story. Our story is all about deeply flawed human beings who constantly sin and make mistakes and constantly attempt still to live within the world and do the best they can. That's our story. It's also not the story that Islam tells about Muhammad. The rabbis tried very hard to make David more perfect. They, they very much wanted to clean up David's stories. 
You know, they edited things out. They created TikToks of him and YouTube. And they made him into this glorious, wonderful human being. But that's not the story that our Tanakh tells. We know that our patriarchs and matriarchs did all kinds of things because we study them. But David did some incredibly terrible things and incredibly insightful genius things. And that's partly why we think of ourselves as one people because of what David put in place eventually. That's not how it started. So <clears throat> we're going to read how his life began and where we get this young man. And that's why I titled this David Emerges from Obscurity. Because he's just on a little outlying um, a farm uh, with sheep in Bethlehem, um, city of, uh, you know, outside of Jerusalem. It's not far, by the way. You can walk it very easily, but I wouldn't suggest it today. <laughs> um, but uh, Joni and I were able to in 1971. Uh, we could walk there, walk around Rachel's tomb, and go into the city, and the sheep were everywhere. You know, uh, in those days, it was a, it was different. Um, but it is it is close to Jerusalem, but it's still a, you know a separate town. So to begin this, I want to share with you. Um, something you don't have. Oh, why did I do that? I need to share. Okay, let's share. And that. And this. This is a timeline. Okay, let's take this timeline here. This is a Hebrew biblical, a biblical timeline. Can you see it? So if you look on the left, you'll see around the year 1100. BCE, right? We're talking about before the Common Era. So that's about 3,300 years ago. 3,000 years ago, 3,100 years ago. We had the period of Judges. <clears throat> that follows, before that, we had the Torah and the book of Joshua. Joshua begins the conquest of the land. And then when you get to Judges, See if I can get that up a little. <clears throat> you get to Judges, you have a period where there were all these figures like Samson and Gideon who led the people for a period of time. They led parts of the people, they led certain tribes, but there was no united group of Jews. We were disparate in 12 tribes, and we lived separately, and we even made war against each other, right? Okay. Once we get to that, we move to the United Kingdom. This moves in two stages. First stage is King Saul. And we're going to look at Saul. King Saul is not able to unite all the tribes. But he is able to unite a significant portion of the people. And they fight certain wars against the Philistines. <clears throat> but Saul is eventually killed. And his um, son is killed, and his other children eventually killed. And a new king must arise, not of Saul. We'll see there is one of his sons that does take over for a short time. And then David comes on the scene. And that's really the United Kingdom. David and Solomon. <clears throat> and you can see, if we go back down, you can see at the bottom, it starts about uh, 1000 BCE. And it goes for about 80 years. That's it. Right? Where are you on? I can't read any of those words. <laughs> oh. All right, it's the, it's the uh, what color pink. is that? It's not a pink. Flesh. Pink. Flesh. It's flesh. the flesh. Uh, yes, yeah. thank you. Then we get to the big the big square that's pink or chartreuse. I don't know what that is. That is sit over here. That, that yes. purple thing? <laughs> yeah. That's when we split into two kingdoms. Yeah. That's when we have... A southern kingdom at the bottom, which we now call Judea or Judah. The northern kingdom, which was called Israel. Okay? And they existed simultaneously until the northern kingdom was destroyed. We're not going to get to any of that part. We're just dealing with the United Kingdom. We're dealing mainly <clears throat> with the end of Judges and the United Kingdom. So we're dealing with period of 1100 to about 920. 
We won't, we'll get a little to Solomon, but we won't do all of Solomon. I hope we'll get through David. So do we all understand where we are? We understand during that period, uh, we don't have a lot, we don't have much writing at all. We know they had alphabet, we know there was some writing, we found some writing. Uh, the Egyptians already had hieroglyphics. They were in the Middle East. There were different forms of writing taking place, but it was still very early. Writing was very difficult. Only certain people knew how to do it. So we don't have documents. Obviously, we don't have photography or video or any of that, but we also don't even have a lot of archaeology because that was a world where by and large, when you conquered, you destroyed. You wiped everything out. And you built on top of what you wiped out. So that's why archaeologists go down in layers, because they try to find stuff. And often what they find is garbage, right? Broken shards, because everything is broken when you're destroying. Or they find layer, layers of burned houses, because they burn everything. That was kind of the way it was done. We do have Shiloh and the city of David. We have city. evidence at certain points, but going back this far, we have very little. And we have nothing that attests to the fact that there was a David king. No. We have a tiny little uh, have inscription that says from the 8th, 9th century, so it's after David, and it says House of David. We don't know if it's that David. There's nothing there that says it was a kingly house. Could have been House of Bark, <laughs> right? Just a local David, a, a local David. We, we have no archeological evidence that actually attests to the fact that there was a King David, that he made Jerusalem city of David, his center, that he built a palace there. Now, there are claims you could go on the tour of the city of David, and the, art, the, the tour will claim that what they found there is, in fact, David's palace, city of David. Reality is there's no unanimity among archaeologists or scholars that any of that is absolutely been attested. In, in point of fact, there's debate about all of it. The only thing we have is what we're going to read, this story. That's what we have about David. What? Psalms attributed to him. Psalms. Yep, there are psalms attributed to him. Right. That's what they are. There's no proof. Well, it just says, you know, Lamanetzeach le David, or it says, you know, Shir le David. I mean, but it doesn't mean if it's a psalm for David, and it doesn't mean it was in in David's name later, David is a figure in our history, like Moses. There's Psalm to Moses. Did Moses write the Psalm? Nobody believes he did. Um, but if you make a Psalm to like, you know, if you, um, in, in music, you know, they will do a piece in, in reflecting, you know, another uh, musical artist, right? So we don't know. All I'm saying is we go into this the same way Christianity goes into it, to their religion, same way Islam goes into their religion, same way Buddhism goes into all of that. There are no records <clears throat> other than the religious records of those traditions. There's no independent source. Even of someone like Jesus, there is an independent source that says there was a Muhammad because we're dealing with the 7th century. But about the stories of Muhammad, only thing we have are what Muhammad gave and his people who were around him told, right? Because his life was, he was a minor figure until he conquered some cities. So we don't know about his early life, but we know the stories that are now told. Okay, <clears throat> any questions about this before we go into David? Or comments? No? Oh. Okay. See where the stage is. <laughs> well, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> wait, wait till we read about David. Yeah, so. You know what's interesting? Did somebody write a play 
<laughs> for those of you who are waiting for music from the play, somewhere along the six sessions, oh. there may be something that will be shared. Well, that's, that's all I can say. say. Rabbi, it's interesting because in costumes? art history, one of the things that we study over and over and over again is the two Davids, the Benini David, the Donovan David, and the Michelangelo David. And their interpretations are so different, but that's yeah, it's interesting. Because when were they writing it? And they're writing it about what part of the story are they writing it? So you have this beautiful David of, um, of, uh, in, in, of, with a slingshot, the young David, right? Um, and you've got this gorgeous body and this tall, slender man. And that's not how he's described, right? Um, no matter how you, because he's such a big figure, same thing with Jesus. I mean, any yeah. figures or Moses, Moses with horns. I mean, all of these people then become important figures for their times. The way we talk <clears throat> about David today is about the time we live in. We're going to be trying to look at who was actually described in our story. This is our story that we're reading. This is the core story. Okay. All right, so let's begin. I, I threw in um, the last line of Judges. It's a repeated line. And it's, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as they pleased. It's actually in the Hebrew. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Kind of what we have today, right? <laughs> everyone does because, but they saw that as bad. They didn't see free will and independence as good because they saw what it did to their society. They had no unifying factor. So everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the critique of Judges that brings us to the book of Samuel. So I'm, I'm just going to do a couple, and then we'll get to the story. So in, the, let, let read. So in Samuel, 1 Samuel, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh with the word of the Lord. There's, if you want to read the story of Samuel, it's in the first two chapters, the beginning of three. Uh, Samuel tells her a nice story of how that's Hannah praying for a child, giving Samuel to the temple with Eli the priest. But we're skipping over that because we want to get to David. All right. <clears throat> she named the boy Ichabod. I know. If you look at it in Hebrew... Ichavod, kavod. Do you see it? Ichavod. It's kavod. Honoring God, right? Glory of God. So, you know, we just know it as Ichabod Crane. Right? I mean, so we don't think of it as a wonderful name. Right? And, and, and therefore, it, we, we haven't been naming our kids Ichabod. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. So, all that we learn. Excuse me, all that we learn and all that we studied in every museum in our time that we've ever gone to study or look are the archivists, the archaeologists about David are totally incorrect. No, no, there is no correct. There are there are ways that you understand the story, but this is the core story of what they had too. Everybody had this story. Right? Because it's the core story of David. It's the only way we know David existed if you, if you believe the story. I mean, you have to say, you know, because there are scholars who say it was written hundreds of years later, it was written and made up for a purpose of validating the kingship of the Davidic monarchy. Again, that's a theory. But the story that we're reading is the, the one that everyone comes off of. So no matter how they shape it, this is the core. Just like when you read about Moses, we shape it differently, but you're reading the story, right? And there's, there is commentary on all this, rabbinic commentary, because they want to shape it. We're not going to look at the commentary. We're going to read the story. So we at least walk away and get a real sense of who this rich, deep character is and was, at least as our story depicts it. Okay, so the glory is departed from Israel. 
referring to the capture of the ark and to the death of her father-in-law and her husband. That's a whole thing with the Philistines. Not going into it. We're at war with the Philistines. They're winning. We're losing. That's all you got to know. All right. The glory is gone from Israel, she said, for the ark of God has been captured. So the Philistines now have the ark. It's not such a machaya, the ark. Actually, every place it rests in the Philistines' territory, plague comes. They get wiped out. So they keep shipping it to God, <laughs> to Gat, you know, Gaza. It's in Gaza. It's going from city to city, destroying everything. They want to get rid of this thing. They don't want to do with it. Because God doesn't apparently want to be in Gaza either. <laughs> I mean, that's, you could take that as a political point, but it's actually, if you read the story, Clearly, the ark is not at home in Gaza. So then we get to chapter 8. All the elders of Israel assembled to come to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You've grown old. Your sons have not followed your ways. So he has two sons who are misusing their authority as the priests. <laughs> They're abusing their authority. Uh, they're also uh, apparently drunkards, and you know they're really corrupt, and everyone knows it. Samuel was a respectable human being and, and prophet and, um, and and priest, but his kids didn't follow in his ways, and so the people are looking around, saying, "Well, who's going to lead us? <coughs> You're old. We need a leader, right?" And that's how they come up with this demand. For a king. Who would like to continue reading now? Okay. Number six. Um, no, therefore, it starts. Okay. Therefore. therefore, appoint a king for us to govern us like all other nations. Samuel was displeased that they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord replied to Samuel, Heed the demand of the people in everything they say to you, for it is not you that they have rejected. It is me they have rejected as their king. Okay, so let's look at that sentence there. So first of all, when he says, heed the demand of the people in everything they say to you, does that echo another time when God says, heed everything? That? Uh, Abraham and Sarah. Went. Right, heed everything that Sarah says yeah. to you, right? Do whatever Sarah says. It's just little echoes in the tradition. And here the same formula is used. Right? Shma Bakol Ha'am instead of Sikol Sarah. So it's not you that they've rejected. It's me they've rejected as king. Now, is God taking it personally here? Is God angry about that? Well, let's find out. Let's read yeah. a little further. But you have to say it sounds on the surface like God might be saying, you know, people don't want me anymore. Right? So maybe God is ready to get out of this covenantal relationship. Okay, continue, please. Like everything else they have done ever since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshiping other gods, so they are doing to you. Heed their demand, but warn them solemnly and tell them about the practices of any king who will rule over them. Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people. Who were asking him for a king. He said, This will be the practice of the king who will rule over you. He will take your sons and appoint them as his charioteers and horsemen, and they will serve as outrunners for his chariots. He will appoint them as his chiefs of thousands and of fifty, and they will have to plow his fields, reap his harvest, and make his weapons and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will seize your choice fields, vineyards, and olive groves, and give them to his courtiers. He will take a tenth part of your grain and vintage, and give it to his eunuchs and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves, your choice, as a... This is, in, in some of this text, it's a little corrupt. So the safari translation, interrupts by saying the Septuagint reads cattle, meaning that's the Greek translation. The Septuagint is the Greek translation. So trying to make sense exactly of what the Hebrew means here. Young men and your asses and put them to work for him. 
He will take a tenth part of your flocks, and you shall become his slaves. The day will come when you cry out because of the king whom you yourselves have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you on that day. Okay, so does he paint a pretty picture of kings? No. 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 <laughs> and is it true? Yes. yes, it's true. I mean, there's nothing here that we haven't seen the kings do in history, right? Kings, ultimately, when they have power, you can get a benevolent king from time to time or a benevolent dictator. But eventually, eventually, this is the way it works. Everybody that they want gets power and wealth, and everybody else works for them, right? However, you have to ask, and the people in effect are saying, if the choice is a God who doesn't seem to be doing it for us, because we're losing to the Philistines, even the Ark of God has been taken, the symbol of God's power. If that's the choice, God being our king, and they mean the one who they turn to as the one to win battles, right? Because they already ostensibly have the traditions, the laws. We don't know that for a fact, but that would be the traditional way of thinking about it. But then the other alternative is kingship, because what else is there in that world? What other form of government is there? They don't know any other form of government. So in effect, they've got to suck it up and say, Okay, if that's what it is, at least we, at least maybe the king can unite us and we can get protection, right? And, and protect our borders and our cattle and our flocks, right? Because that's ultimately what we want. We want some security. And we're willing to pay for it. Okay, any comments, questions about that? Okay. But the people would not listen to Samuel's warning. No, they said, we must have a king over us, that we may be like all other nations. Let our king rule over us and go out our head and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that, the people said, he reported it to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, feed their demands and appoint a king for them. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, all of you go home. Okay. So now we get to 1 Samuel 9. And we're going to get to the song uh, and the appointment. Samuel is not given very good instructions by God about who to choose, right? And how would Samuel know? Well, he might know because he looks at the Philistines and at other tribes and see who they choose. They tend to choose warriors. This was the day of warrior kings. I mean, when we think about it, that's what uh, Alexander was even in the fourth century, right? Still the warrior king, or even during Rome, you had the, you know, the various people who went out to war became the king, right? The ones who won honor in war became the king. When uh, uh, Vespasian was, uh, was fighting the war against our people in, uh, uh, and about to destroy Jerusalem, he was appointed king, and his son Titus then took over the war. I mean that, so that was already in the first century of the common era. That's a very common approach. So he doesn't know, but he's going to be looking for someone strong, big, warrior, right? Because this was a day and age about brute force. They only had their only technology was what? Chariots. They had slingshots. They had chariots. Chariots was big. That was their tank. They had, they had rocks. Swords. Bows and arrows. Swords. And it was early in the sword period, by the way. You know, it was still, it wasn't common to be able to create strong metals. Um, and it wasn't, you couldn't do it everywhere in the Middle East. Only certain sections had it. Um, it actually took really a very long time before they were able to perfect the, the swords that were in, even used during the Crusades. You know, be able to forge these very strong swords. Okay, so let's see who gets chosen. Someone else want to read? Okay. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of the Korah, 
son of Aphiach, a Benjam Benjaminite, a man of substance. So obviously he was a chef who made kish. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to do that. But, yeah. but most importantly, he's a Benjamin. He's a Benjamin. What is Benjamin? The tribe of Benjamin. What do we know about the tribe of Benjamin? The smallest, smallest tribe. So interestingly yeah. enough, he goes to small tribe, Benjamin. Right? And 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 is looking there. He okay. had a son whose name was Saul. An excellent young man. No one among the Israelites was handsomer than he. Taller from his shoulders up. He was a head taller than any of the people. Once the asses of Saul's father, Kish, went astray, and Kish said to his son, Saul, take along one of the servants and go out and look for the asses. He passed into the hill country of Ephraim. He crossed the district of Shalisha. 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 But they did not find him. They did not find them. They passed through the districts of Shalim, but they were not there. They tra traversed the entire territory of Benjamin, and still they did not find them. When they reached the <clears throat> district of Zup, Zup. Zup uh, Saul said to the servant who was with him, let us turn back or my father will stop worrying about the asses and begin to worry about us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he replied, there is a man of God in that town, and the man is highly esteemed. Everything that he says comes true. Let us go there. Perhaps he will tell us about the errand on which we set out. But if we go, Saul said to his servant, what can we bring the man? For the food in our bags is all gone, and there is nothing we can bring to the man of God as a present. What have we got? The servant answered Saul again, I happen to have a quarter shekel of silver. Can give that to the man of God, and he will tell us about our errand. So you see, the whole idea of, um, of paying for yeah. prophecy or paying for service was very much a part. They knew they had to bring something, right? Yeah. Why would the servant have silver and Saul would not? Well, only because it's it sort of like with Eliezer when he's sent, you know, out on a mission. Um, he's given, you know, flocks and sheep and stuff to make the mission happen. And it may be that, you know, instead of, um, uh, instead of Saul carrying it, the servant was carrying it. And we don't know. All we know is what we're reading here. Right? Okay. Anything else? Okay. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he would say, Come, let us go to the seer. For the prophet of today was formerly called a seer. Saul said to his servant, a good idea, let us go. And they went to the town where the man of God lived. By the way, that little line in there, of for the prophet of today was formerly called a seer, that obviously was written much later. Because it's a footnote. <coughs> See how it's a footnote? Mm -hmm. They're telling the people of today when the prophet is not a seer, that in those days they function both as a seer meaning telling what's going to happen, and a prophet in the sense of the way we have literary prophets, where they talk about the big picture, right? The way the people are sinning and the need to repent. Isaiah, Jeremiah, right? So this gets put in here, and then it gets codified in the text. But it, you wouldn't have it if they were just writing it, because they knew what a seer was in those days. <clears throat> As they were climbing the ascent to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water, and they asked them, Is the seer in town? Yes, they replied, He is up there ahead of you. Uh, let's and do see. hurry, for he has just reaped. He has just reaped. Okay, he hurry. That's from the Septuagint. Hurry, for he has just come to the town. Dash C. Because the people have a sacrifice at the shrine today. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the shrine to eat. Wait, you will go up to the town. Oh, my people. The people will not eat. He's not eating the people. This is not the purple people eating. Okay, let's take you. Uh, the people will not eat until he comes. For he must first bless the sacrifice, 
and only then will the guest eat. Go up at once, for you will find him right away. So they went up to the town, and as they were entering the town, Samuel came out toward them on his way up to the shrine. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed the following to Samuel. At this time tomorrow, I will send a man to you from the territory of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him ruler of my people Israel. Okay, wait one second. Okay. First of all, why do we have that whole story? What do we need the story of the asses and the girls? And the questioning and the having the gift. And what do we need all of that for? Yeah, it's like, so people will keep reading. Because <laughs> it's an interesting story. It adds details. Yeah. Maybe it helps establish Samuel's authority. It's like a preliminary for God saying, I'm sending you someone, he's going to be your king. But why would Samuel be there? Because they were having a celebration at the shrine and trying and he was going to get a stage dinner. You know, it's, possible. It's, it's like setting it up and giving him a reason to be there. Right. Other, any other ideas? Yeah. Shows something good about him. He goes, he's strong, he's searching for his father, but then he's concerned his father might be worried about him. So he could give something that he can. Good. Okay. Just, yeah. Because he has to always consult women, and women will always direct you to the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> In my experience, that is true. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is absolutely true. Now, also, we should recognize that that also tells us that when we receive, when they receive text, they were very, they were loath to cut it out. They were not trying to trim the story, they weren't trying to figure what's the essence, and let's just get to the point. Because the point is to get a king. And and all of this other stuff may add texture, it may add legitimacy, it may do all that, but more importantly from their perspective, they received it. This is all received. It was all oral. right? They didn't have all this stuff written out on parchment. They heard the story, and they passed the story verbatim. That was their job. Their job was the, the, good, the ones that had good memory who were called memorizers. We even have them in the Talmud and the Mishnah where the rabbi will call the memorizer in and say uh, recite and they'll recite and then the rabbi will teach on the recitation. That's already you know a thousand years later because you're living with a world where they don't have libraries they don't have books. They're not literate. Everything is most, almost everything is passive. Orally, with very few exceptions. Only in the palace, where you had scribes, and only between kind of major economic figures, and they would have certain economic markings, so you knew how many sheep you had and things like that. But, but by and large, it was a society of oral law and oral transmission. So they got this, they received it when they were writing, and they wrote it. Because why would you cut out something that had been received? Right? Something that someone had memorized and given to you. You wouldn't cut it out. And they didn't. And we'll see that throughout. That, that there are things there that you might have excised, but they didn't. They give it to us, good and bad. Okay. Um, let's see. He will deliver my people from the hands of the Philistines, for I have taken note of um, my people. My people. The plight of my people. Their outcry has come to me. As soon as Samuel saw Saul, the Lord declared to him, This is the man that I tell you would govern my people. Saul approached Samuel inside the gate, and he said to him, Tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up ahead of me to the shrine, for you shall eat with me today, and in the morning I will let you go after telling you whatever may be on your mind. So he gets to eat at the captain's table on the ship, right? He gets to go right to the seer's table. As for your asses that strayed three days ago, do not concern yourself about them, for they have been found. And for whom is all Israel yearning? If not for you and all your ancestral house? Saul replied, But I am only a Benjaminite, 
from the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my clan is the least of all the clans of the tribe. Why do you say such things to me? Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of the guest, who numbered about 30. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you and told you to set aside. The cook lifted up the thigh, um, the broad tail, what was, what was on it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, uh, what has been reserved is set before you. Eat. It has been kept for you for this occasion. When I said I was inviting the people, so Saul ate with Samuel that day. And then they descended from the shrine to the town. And they spread a bed for Saul on okay. the and he lay down. And Samuel talked with Saul on the roof. Early the break of day, Samuel called up to Saul on the roof. He said, get up, and I will send you off. Saul arose, and the two of them, Samuel and he, went outside. As they were walking toward the end of the town, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to walk ahead of us. And he walked ahead. But you stop here a moment, and I will make known to you the word of God. Okay. So again, this is going to be the first king of Israel. <clears throat> so we're we're going to hear the whole story, right? We're not just going to have get right to the crowning. We're going to hear all this, all of this nuance about the discussion between them, the fact that he ate with them, the fact that the donkeys, the asses were found. That he's already, you know, don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. Now let's talk about just as you pursued. All across Benjamin, these asses, you are in what we need. We need someone who will, in effect, you know, corral the people and lead them. And God has chosen you. Now, he sees the way the people treat Samuel, right? So he has every reason to believe. Because he, it's not like... You know, where there was a picture of Samuel in everyone's house. <laughs> right? No one ever, no one knew what he looked like. The only way you knew is when people knew who he was. Because he traveled from place to place in that area. And so here all the people are honoring him. So you know, you know, it's, uh, it's him. In fact, there's a, a, a famous Hasidic story about um, a Rebbe who's about to come to a town that he's never been to before. And his driver says to him, uh, Rabbi, you know, you always are honored in the town, and I'm just there to serve you. And I would really once just love to be honored the way you are. And so the rabbi says, you know what? Change places with me. Put on my, my clothes, get in the carriage, and I will, um, I will walk before you. Comes into the town, and the rabbi, is, the, the attendant is being honored like he's the rabbi. And uh, they start asking him questions. <laughs> and some of the questions he can answer, and then they get to a question where he clearly has no clue. He says, what a foolish question. Even my attendant can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in effect, you know, you like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, in effect, you're living, you have to always think of the world that we're, re that we're reading about. The kind of world we're reading about. Basically, when sun comes up, they're up and they're working. When sun goes down, you know, oil is expensive. They don't have candles. They have oil, they have oil, but it's not cheap. And they don't just burn it, and they're not burning it and reading, right? By and large, they live with the rhythm of their of their na of nature, and they're living a fairly simple life. So he's. A, he's attending to the donkeys. He's attending to his father's farm. That's what Saul is doing. And he's fighting war when he has to fight war. Because the same people are soldiers, are farmers. Right? Shepherds are soldiers. Everybody is a soldier. Every male is a soldier when war comes to the people. Still that way in Israel. Well, and Israel is model. I mean, our tradition models after that. And it's part of how Zionism evolved the notion, you know, we talk about settlers negatively, some of us today, but settling and settlers was how Israel was settled. You put them on the border, they had, um, right, put this, you had a gun, 
and a plow, and you worked the field, and that secured the field. Uh, you know, that's in effect the way it was done. All right, let's go on. Uh, sure, uh, and, and someone else, go ahead. And Samuel said to the people, Do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people acclaimed him, shouting, Long live the king. Samuel expounded to the people the rules of the monarchy and recorded them in a document which he deposited before the Lord. Samuel then sent the people back to their homes. Okay. Have you seen that document? <laughs> <laughs> there. One of the interesting things about the Bible, the Tanakh, there are at least 50 books, this is one of them, uh, or documents that are labeled that we don't have. We don't have, we never can get them. But they obviously existed at some point, and they had them in their, whatever the library was, they had them, um, and they never came down to us. I, I think the Lord took it. <laughs> Everybody taking it, and maybe when Elijah comes, he'll yeah. bring them all back. Okay. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there at Gilgal, they declared Saul king before the Lord. They offered sacrifices of well being there before the Lord, and Saul and all the men of Israel held great celebration. If you will revere the Lord, worship him, and obey him, and will not flout the Lord's command, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, well and good. But if you do not obey the Lord and you flout the Lord's commands, the hand of the Lord will strike you, uh, it, as it did your fathers. Okay, so you see I'm skipping sections here, because I'm taking us through the story, but obviously it's all there if you want to read all the, the stuff that's in between. <clears throat> but he's saying, again, same philosophy that we have in the Bible, in the Torah, if you keep God's way, it will be good. And if you don't, there's consequences. Is that Samuel talking? Yeah. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> you know, the notion is you are, you have to act right. You're not just going to succeed because you got a king. You still got to fight. And that will be the prophets later, the rabbis later. That is the Jewish philosophy. It's about acts, it's about how you act. Christianity will have that argument about whether it's acts or grace. We, we didn't have that argument. Our tradition, all the way through, by and large, is it's all about it's about <coughs> acting, acting right, and then things can follow. Right? Okay. Samuel answered Saul. Shall we that change of vocalization yields you acted foolishly? If, if you, you had kept the commandment the Lord your God laid upon you, you acted foolishly in not keeping the commandments that the Lord your God laid upon. Otherwise, the Lord would have established your dynasty over Israel forever. So we have an incident that I cut out. It's uh, Torah where um, Saul is commanded to wipe out uh, this a descendant of Amalek um, <clears throat> and um, and not keep anything, kill the cattle, kill the women, kill the children. It's a very brutal world we're talking about. Um, but they actually keep some of this stuff. <clears throat> And he doesn't kill the king. The king. So Saul shows up and basically says, if you'd only done what you're supposed to do. But you didn't do it, so your dynasty is over. That's it. You didn't act properly. You didn't do what you were told to do. Your job is not to question. Your job is to obey. And this is what you were to obey. Now, who tells him to obey? Samuel. Right? So you got to believe that Samuel has a pipeline to God. Maybe Saul doubted that. Maybe Saul thought, you know, the precedent of killing kings is not a good precedent. Right? Because I'm a king. And after all, David will act that way as well. We'll see later. David will act that way when someone kills Saul. Puts him out of his misery, but kills him. David will kill that person, because you don't kill kings. So maybe he thought that. Maybe he thought, you know, I, I wouldn't want to set that precedent. I may not honor him. I may keep him in locked up, but I'm not going to kill the king. And you know, my men worked really hard here, the soldiers. They do deserve stuff. Maybe I can be a little lenient. Right? Let them take some booty. Right? 
Maybe. Maybe that's what he thought. And maybe Samuel's getting old. Maybe he didn't hear it so clearly. Maybe it's not that necessary. And anyway, what control does he have? I'm king. My son Jonathan's going to take over after me. That's what's going to happen. Maybe. Maybe that's what he thought. Right? And Samuel comes to him and says, sorry, it's over. And then Samuel kills the king, a god. Samuel runs the sword through him. So he may be old, but he's still got it. Right? You still got to have the strength to run a sword through someone. Um, as barbaric as this sounds, and in your description, there are civilizations still alive today that sound very similar. Very similar. Well, and I won't go into too many details. No, no, no you don't have to, because because no. that was, but that was the world in general. The good news is there is civilization where that doesn't take place, and that is the bulk of the world today, and it wasn't. In those days, the world was this. It was a vicious, cruel, difficult world. We have made enormous progress, and I think we always need to recognize it and call it out. Enormous progress. But we need to, when we read this story, we need to go back and understand the way they saw the world, and they saw it as a cruel, difficult world where if you didn't do what you had to do, you would eventually suffer the consequences and your family and your people. Okay. Shall we go on? Or next. Go ahead. But now your dynasty will go the door. The Lord will speak how the man after his own heart, and the Lord will appoint him ruler over his people. Because you did not abide by what the Lord had commanded you. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and set out. I am sending you to Jesse the best of might, for I have decided on one of his sons to be king. Okay, how long will you grieve? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> well, why is he pouting? He didn't even want a king, right? Maybe he thought, maybe he thought, okay, you see God? He told me to do what they wanted? See what happens? Maybe it's, let's go back to the old way. The old way was better. Okay, maybe not my sons. Let's have another prophet. Maybe another seer. Maybe let's go back to the judges. You know, there is a model that they could have used, which is the model of the Philistines. Philistines have five major cities, and they have, in effect, a king over each city. And they function as a community of kings, the five kings, and they go to war together. So maybe, maybe that's another model. Maybe Samuel is saying, okay, God, we tried. Didn't work out. Let's try something else. Sounds like the Godfather. <laughs> five families. Yeah, no, he, he kills the five families. No. Well, David will do that, and that's exactly, in effect, what the Godfather was emulating <clears throat> David. Because David's going to take care of business before he dies. But that's another whole issue. Okay, so now Samuel, get over it. We want a king. They want a king. Let's get a king. We're going down to Jesse. We like that name. <laughs> He's shy. Okay. Family. Samuel replied, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. The Lord answered, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrificial feast, and then I will make known to you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I point out to you. By the way, does that sound familiar to you? He did it to, as we said before. He did it to Saul. I'll show you that. Right? He had a sacrificial, he had him eat with him. Right? Now he's doing the same thing with whoever he's going to pick, but he picks the father because, as we'll find out, he has seven sons. It's not clear he has to pick one of them. So, okay. Samuel did what the Lord commanded. When he came to Bethlehem, the elders of the city went out in alarm to meet him and said, You come on a peaceful errand? Yes, he replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and join me in the sacrificial feast. He also instructed Jesse and his sons to purify 
purify themselves and invited them to the sacrificial feast. Purify themselves. Hmm. What is that? Think about it. Think about it. Could be some kind of, <clears throat> again, this is early. We don't know that there are mikvahs from this period that have been identified. This is early. This is, after all, before the first temple. You know, we don't have any archaeological evidence. Maybe it was just pour water over your hands. Maybe it was a, a different kind of purification. Um, we don't know. Could have been oil. They used oil to purify. I'm sorry. What? Fasting. Fasting, maybe. I mean, we don't know. But obviously, they had a concept of purification that they followed before the feast, right? Whatever it was. And in today's, in, in our feasting, traditionally, you wash your hands and say the blessing over an entilat yadayim, over the washing of hands. And it's not washing your hands like with soap and 20 seconds and singing happy birthday, <laughs> right? It's just pouring the water over your hands as a ritual. Right, wash. Okay. When they arrived and he saw Eliab, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, pay no attention to his appearance or his stature, for I have rejected him. So what is that? Pay no, uh, pay no heed to his appearance or stature. He must have been. He must have been good. But Not just that. Remember what he did last time. Saul was the he handsome guy. Saul was the big, handsome guy. Right? We're not going for that the second time. We're going to go for some other kind of leadership. Not just military leadership and strength, physical, but something else that we're looking for. So okay. does this mean that God erred? Or he's learning? Like, why wouldn't God know who the right one was from the beginning? Well, it's Samuel that needs to know. Now, couldn't God have just said, being you, yeah. it's not the way the story works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. I story. Story. you know, we, I mean, well, there's a lesson in it. Mm -hmm. it just says, telling how we got it's to telling the story, but again, you're dealing with David. So the lead up to how he gets chosen and why nobody else gets chosen, it has to be so obvious that he, out of seven brothers, clearly it's him. And and he's not he like Benjamin was the least tribe, he's like the small one. He's the one that anyone else might look at and say, no, it's not him. Right? Okay. Pay no attention to his appearance or his statue, for I have rejected him. If the Lord is a man sees, does the Lord see? Man sees only what is visible. The Lord sees into the heart. Okay, Lord sees into the heart. It's going to be an important notion with David. <coughs> the idea of he is something of God's heart. There's almost like a connection between whatever is in David and what God wants human beings to be. Right? And again, it's not about his actions because he makes lots of mistakes and lots, does a lot of terrible things. But it is about what his instinct is. And it is, and we'll see that throughout his story. It is about his way of looking at the world and the way he understands his role as a Jew. Though he's not a Jew at that time, he's a he's a Judahite. You know, he's a member of the tribe of Judah. Uh, there is no Jewish people yet, there are tribes. Um, but how he sees himself as a Hebrew, if you will. <coughs> Can I ask a question? Of course. But you did, you did say earlier that this, to a great extent, is about his actions, not just about his thoughts and his reflections. Well, his actions time. will, his actions will depict who he is. But we are, we're going to have to look at his actions carefully, because you have to see how does that reflect on his character, right? And again, it's a complex character. Yeah, I mean, a complex character. Yeah, there's a, a, a phrase in the Talmud, uh, the greater the person, the greater the Yetzir Hara. Remember that. Um, you know, the, meaning the more powerful a person, the more a person, if you will, accomplishes, the greater is the draw to the dark side. Right? And they, they did that in Star Wars. 
Yeah. Right? You know, the greater Jedi become drawn to the dark side. And the resistance, ultimately, Ray resists in the second series. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. It's not the Godfather. Yeah. It's not the Godfather. Is this what you're doing in retirement? <laughs> okay, let's move on. We're going to go till 12 one thirty for today. We're making good progress. We at least got to do that. was the first one. Okay. Then Jesse called <laughs> Abinadab. Abinadab and had him pass before Samuel. <laughs> he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse presented Shema and said, and, and again he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus, Jesse presented seven of his sons before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the boys you have? He replied, There is still the youngest. He is standing the flock. There is a contradiction as to whether there are seven or eight boys. Traditionally, there are seven. <clears throat> but this seems to indicate there were eight. So, if, because we have other texts that seem to indicate there were seven. But, however, he had a lot of boys, right? Mm -hmm. And he saw all of them. And in this story, he says, That's it. But I, I didn't find the the kid. And then he says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Send someone to bring him, for we will not eat. sit down to eat until he gets here. So they sent and brought him. He was ruddy cheeked, bright eyed, and handsome. Now, ruddy cheeked, bright eyed, and handsome. He's actually understood to be reddish. Understood, ruddy is a reddish look, um, with a, you know the way redheads tend to look, and kind of a ruddy complexion, right? Now, how we got that in the middle of the Middle East, um, you know. However, genetic things happen. Maybe somewhere in the line was from another part, from Philistines or somewhere else. We don't know because there's some sense that Philistines came from other parts of the Mediterranean. However, David clearly doesn't look like the others, and his appearance makes him stand out, right? And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord gripped David from that day on. Okay, so who is the witness to this? Who witnesses the brothers, this? The brothers. Only the family. The only the brothers. They're the only witnesses to this moment. That will be important because what did what did uh, Samuel say to God? If Saul finds out, he'll kill me. So something about Samuel understands something about Saul at this point. If Saul is maybe unhinged a bit, that he is vindictive, and that side of him has emerged already, because we'll see later as he pursues David, we'll see much more of that, but maybe already Samuel sees what's happened to Saul, and he needs to keep this very private. But we're also going to see that the sons of David later on will not know this story. They won't understand why David is a great warrior and becomes a favorite of the king. So we're going to see a number of stories about David that don't mesh with other stories about David. It's almost as if there are a number of these legends that came down, and when the editor, whoever edited these sections, put them together, he put them together in this form that we received, but they may not have actually been the same story in the same sense that the New Testament, any of you who've ever read the New Testament, we had to do that in school, has uh, four books of the life of Jesus, three that tell it in a synchronous way, and one that's the book of John, which is a little different, the Gospel according to John. But those three stories each tell the story in broad strokes, similarly, but with varying, a lot of variations and a lot of differences. And it may have been that originally 
There were three, four, five, if you will, scrolls of stories of David, and they put them together into one, and they didn't try to mesh them. The rabbis will in, in commentary, but they didn't try to mesh them. Yeah. So um, I have a two-part question. Number one, I wanted to know a little bit more about the editor, and number two, <laughs> in all of your great wisdom, what was enamoring to you about wanting to write and study and adapt a play about this whole story? That's so we're going to hold that personal. question until next month. <laughs> I don't want to forget my question. Wait, sorry, I'm sure that somebody will yeah. remember. Um, and Rabbi doesn't know the editor, and I don't know the editor, and no one knows the And we don't know if it was one editor or a hundred editors. Of what were called often redactors in our tradition, um, because they didn't edit in the way an editor today does, where they actually you know mark and change and stuff. We think much of what they did was putting pieces together, you know, kind of cutting and pasting. Um, but we don't know. I mean, all of this is guesswork of scholars who've studied it in detail, but they don't agree on how it got to us, right? And and the reason you're seeing the Septuagint here is because the Septuagint was an early translation of the Tanakh, right? Somewhere around, um, we think, two centuries before the Common Era, somewhere around that period in there. Um, and it was in Greek. And it seems to have things in it translated in a different way than our Hebrew text that's called the Masoretic text that we received is. So, we use that, some people try to use the Vulgate, which is the Latin translation, but that wasn't written till the fourth century CE. There's an Aramaic translation from an early period, some they'll use that. So scholars will try to figure out, but we don't know how it got shaped exactly, and we don't even know when it got shaped. The kind of general assumption is somewhere around the sixth, seventh century BCE, somewhere at the court of Judea, it was getting shaped by the scribes, but we don't know. So the second part of my question. That I'm not going to answer today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else? I'll remind you. We'll have a wonderful sukkah and Shabbos, and we will finish this and go on to the next text. Should we